Go ahead and roll. All right, we have sound and everything? Yes. All right, yes. <laughs> That's right. Oh my gosh. Why I didn't bring pie? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Um, welcome to everyone, uh, to the people here at Madison College, as well as people scattered throughout the day. You're at the wrong place. <laughs> we are people getting together trying to make a difference. And being as such, we just, we, we, do, we do things our way. And we do things in ways that work for us. Um, so I'm hoping now that we have sound turned on, I know that 820, as of 825 we didn't have sound, but now we have sound, so we're good to go. So we're going to dig right in. This is the Community of Practice on Autism Spectrum Disorder and Other Developmental Disabilities. We've been around the state of Wisconsin for over eight years now. We started out as a grant funded by the federal government, and then after the grant ended, a group of people got together and we said, well, what parts of the stuff that we worked on on the grant did you want to keep? And they said, we would love to keep meeting as community practice of autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities. Said they love the fact that we bring together educators in the same room as parents, in the same room as self-advocates, in the same room as researchers, in the same room as social workers, and we all learn together, we can interact together, we could get each other's point of view so that we could get out of our own little silos and out of our own little spaces and start to see the world out of the Autism Society of Wisconsin. And at various events, people step forward and it happens. We're able to continue to bring people together. The people that make today happen are the awesome people at Madison College, uh, Disability Resource Services, who said, yes, we'll give you a room, come on over. It's fantastic, we'll even give you free parking. All right then. So we get to park and we get a, a nice place here. Um, includes the, uh, Clark, who is running the camera and the sound out of the Waysman Communications team. Um, couldn't do this without them. And then we have 17 different sites throughout Wisconsin and Minnesota. And without site coordinators, without those people that are opening the doors and welcoming people and leading the discussions a little bit later on, this wouldn't happen at all. And so I really would like to, to say thank you to those people and also to our, our, our site coordinators. Um, just so, just so you all know, because some of you were keeping a running tally, um, site coordinators, as of yesterday, um, Madison College is supposed to have the most people. But looking around my room today, folks, I don't think we're going to make it. <laughs> I think another site may, may beat us out. But closely behind uh, was the uh, UW Superior. Um, amazing. Up, up north there, they're still shoveling, um, is my understanding. Um, is there still still shoveling out and it, it's probably about 10 degrees. So welcome Superior, really, really happy to have you here. Wisconsin Sibs and Appleton, also a huge turnout, um, again, according to the registration. So those, those sites I just really wanted to point out. Um, along with, just so y'all know, um, we have the ADRC in Brown County um, is hosting a site today, CESA 7 in Green Bay. The Oh, I'm so sorry. Park Falls, Chequamagon School District um, is, is also hosting for the first time. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. CESA 7, I think this is your first year as well. Chalita down in La Crosse um, has joined us for a second year. Um, Barron County, thank you so much for joining us. Barron County, a um, couple collaborators up there, including Growing Opportunities and Resources. The Human Service Center in Rhinelander has joined us again. Kenosha Unified Schools had a fantastic registration turnout, so we're really excited of support from Kenosha Unified Schools. Marathon County Health Department, smack dab middle of the state, Wausau, way to go. Uh, Milwaukee County Disability Services, thank you so much for joining us, Milwaukee. Um, up in Sturgeon Bay, uh, Nick Lake National Bank opened up a room for us. Um, over at the UW Waysman Center, my stopping ground, is another site as well as Superior. We do have people joining us from UW Whitewater. Waukesha County Technical College, thanks for joining us this year. We appreciate that. And the Wisconsin Sibs, along with Autism Society of Wisconsin, and then Carleton County, Minnesota. So thank you, Carleton County. Uh, my goal next year is to find someone in Canada so then we can have an international 
community of practice on autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities because with the internet there are no boundaries so those are our sites thank you very much i do have a couple of general announcements that people turned into me and asked me to to talk briefly about i apologize there was one announcement that came through that the file did not open so it was from a group in green bay called kismet advocacy um, they are obviously having some sort of event i just don't know what it is um, because the file decided it didn't want to open. So if you're in Green Bay area, want to find out more what's happening with Kismet Advocacy, feel free to check them out. If you're in the southern part of the state, um, the Autism Society of South Central Wisconsin is having their annual walk, One Walk, Big Strides for Autism, on Sunday, April the 22nd. Um, if you go to autismsouthcentral.org, we apply locally because we know that change has to happen locally. It's in our communities that we need to be making the changes um, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our businesses. Um, that's where our work is. And so I encourage you to have those local discussions, find your local resources, build on your local strengths, and make a difference locally. Um, so with that being said, if there are local announcements, I would say use the time during the first break, during the first announcement, uh, to go ahead and make those local announcements. Um, and so we will have, after the 15 minute discussion time, we will have a break um, when you won't hear sound from here. And then when you hear sound again, that means we're gonna get ready to get started. So without further ado, enough of me on this screen, I'm gonna bring up James. Um, James is a friend of mine. Um, also, I have a wonderful, here, here he, he is a, he's an adult with autism, diagnosed at the age of three in 1991. He graduated from Glenbrook North High School in Northbrook, Illinois in 2010. Oh, geez. So it says Daisho, 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 thank you. <laughs> Daisho Khan, Metro Com, and Kasuni. Khan. Yeah. Yes, Kasuni Khan. <laughs> and other venues such as National Hobo Convention. He also consults regularly at schools on autism. Today, he's going to talk about self determination. Self determination is routinely discussed as something important for people with autism. But how does one properly do it? And where do you draw the line between acting self-determined and being perceived as stuck up or spoiled? In this presentation, James is gonna talk about how to differentiate between speaking up for yourself versus coming across as spoiled or stuck up when advocating for your needs. So it is my absolute pleasure to bring up James because he's not just a presenter. He's not just on the steering team. James, I consider to be a friend. So I am so excited to introduce you to James Williams. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody who was able to make it today, who has chosen to do so for the purpose as to why it has been created. I wish them the best because that is one, because in participating to promote safety schools, you are learning proper self-determination. And I hope that every teacher and administrator helps students understand the importance of events like this and to not abuse them to just cut class. <laughs> now, one of the things that I think is very important when it comes to self-determination is the fact that we we tend to sometimes focus on too much of some parts of this subject and not about other aspects of this subject. And what do I mean by this? Well, one of the things I've noticed about many self-determination discussions is that a lot of them tend to focus on you, how can this person understand me the best. How do I come across to this person? One of the reasons why I made that whole point about drawing the line between being stuck up or spoiled is because one reality that people with autism have to live with, and this is luckily not as true today as it was 20 years ago when I was a kid diagnosed, is that 
sadly, a lot of the behaviors that we commonly see in autism are associated in our culture as behaviors of people who are spoiled and stuck up. In fact, one metaphor I often use whenever I discuss this subject to teachers is the fact that there was a time when if you had autism, you were often mistaken as a Veruca Salt or a Dudley Dursley. Two literary examples, many of their behaviors actually mirror those with autism. Suppose, for example, Dudley Dursley had gotten the same number of presents every year. And for the first time, he got a different number of presents. While clearly the intent of that outburst is for Dudley to be stuck up, to demand his parents give him the same amount of presents, you could very plausibly attribute that behavior to a routine change and argue that Dudley was on the spectrum. As for Veruca, you could also have attributed that to a routine change, too, if, his par if her parents were truly constantly giving her a bunch of ponies. However, we sadly live in a world where a lot of behaviors that are a part of autism, which are in most cases not a trip, not because they are spoiled or stuck up, come across that way. And therefore, if one really amazing way to demonstrate this also appears in our cinema. Who here has ever seen the movie Elf before? Anyone remember Elf? Anyone remember all the social situations he found himself in in New York City? <laughs> How many times people thought, him, thought of Buddy the Elf as bad? The negativity that he created, even though everyone who saw that movie knew he was just an innocent elf from the North Pole who didn't understand social norms. The problem wasn't that Buddy the Elf was a bad person. It's just that in our society, we live in a world that associates certain behaviors with certain temperaments and with certain qualities. We associate some behaviors as good behaviors and some behaviors as bad behaviors. And it just so happened that many behaviors that ELF engaged in, we as a society associate the you can't speak up for everything. And there are some things that you are not able to speak up for. And one thing that often amazes me is that a lot of teachers and professionals who understand that one core social deficit of autism, of autism is the inability to understand how social rules are different in social contexts, those same teachers will just flat out tell a teenager with autism, speak up for yourself without even giving any awareness to what the rules and limitations are and the different contexts in which you can or can't speak up for yourself in. I mean, what often amazed me, I actually took a class in high school called self-determination. What amazed me was there was so much emphasis on us learning how to defend our needs by teachers who ostensibly understood that we can't, being autistic, naturally understand how these are different in different contexts without even really telling us how those rules differ in different places and what you can and cannot fight for. And one, and, and, and one thing I had to learn when I went out into the community, when I went out to travel as a speaker after finishing high school, is that there are many unwritten rules regarding unwritten rules and nuances of the social skills you're teaching about much better than those you are teaching. 
And with self-determination, it can be very hard. If you instinctively understand when you say to your students, self-determinate, and you understand automatically what the rules are, but they don't. It's very common, in fact, for many people with autism to not be able to take sarcasm. I can tell you right now that one, reason, one of the reasons why that inability to take sarcasm exists is because many people with autism have been in situations where sometimes things that are sarcastic among non-autistic people haven't always been sarcastic when you are a person with autism. For example, if you've been rejected and thrown out of groups, if you have to live in a world where you might get thrown out of a location by security because you didn't follow some unwritten social rule that no one told you and everyone expected you to know, telling a person with autism sarcastically something like that, they're going to believe it because most people with autism have been in times where some security officer told them you need to leave the premises and they thought it was sarcastic and got in more trouble because they thought the security guard was joking. The fact is being unable to understand how social rules are different is a very serious issue and so I say this to any teacher who's listening to this right now. If you're going to teach self-determination, you can't just stop there. You have to teach the basic rules and nuances. And here's basically where I would propose we start. If you're in, cannot meet them. Not every place is legally entitled to meet your needs. Some places are, some places are not. Michael John Carley, a self-advocate with autism, discusses this phenomenon regarding employment. He has written in several of his books, the ADA only protects you in employment to the extent that you can perform the essential functions of a job. If you cannot perform the essential functions of a job because of, of, of needs that you have, you can still be fired. And I can tell you honestly, there was a career path I had to abandon because I discovered I had a need that that career path was never going to meet. And I had to accept abandoning that career path. I had to accept that there was no way that need was going to get accommodated. And so what I basically am going to say here is know when you're speaking up for yourself, what is the legal requirement for them accommodating you? If it's employment, you have to be able to perform the functions of the job and if they're giving you accommodations, you have to show that you can perform those functions. Now, some places are legally required to accommodate certain needs, like many public facilities, like public transportation. Throughout my educational career, a limitation slowly emerged that did not disappear as I got older. Although I am, I am very capable of, of functioning in sustained loud environments like say a loud city street where there's sustained loud noise, sound and loud noises can be very painful for me. And no matter how old I was, whether it was in grade school or high school, 
the mandatory fire drills in our schools have always been very traumatic for me. And my body was basically telling me in high school that I wouldn't be able to handle an entire professional career with fire drills. So I had to abandon that path. I realized that, the, that having to deal with the, the loud noise of a fire alarm for the next 40, 50 years of my working life was going to be too much for me. I realized that in that case, speaking up for myself, being self-determined, wasn't going to involve trying to fight this struggle I had with fire drills and pursue this career. What it really meant was I had to walk away from it. One other thing that we also have to be teaching people with autism is that when you have to fight, when you are fighting for the right to partake in something, you can't fight for the right to be included everywhere. So many people with autism grow up with teachers who speak so much about inclusion. But inclusion doesn't work everywhere. The reality is we live in a world that has to sometimes exclude. And what I say is, here's another thing we have to teach. When you are fighting to be included, you can only fight for the right to be included in a social setting where you have the right to be there if you were not autistic and had the same to speak up for is helping others find people who are familiar with an activity they are entitled to partake in to help them understand those rules. Because one reality I have to live with what a lot of people with autism have to live with is that we're often unfairly excluded from places because we don't understand unwritten social rules instinctively that others expect us to know. Every social setting that I have succeeded in was not because I learned social skills better than other kids with autism in a social skills group. It was not because I happened to comprehend the list of social rules from a social skills workbook by a school social worker or by following proper behavior and would very respectfully tell me if you want to be a part of this activity do you have a legal right to be a part in that activity? And, and if so, what are those social rules? Why do I say legal right? Because there are many activities that restrict themselves to certain people. Probably a very classic local example which really demonstrates those self-determination limitations. I know many people in this room are very familiar with this. Who here has been to the Autism Society of Wisconsin State Conference? Well, longtime attendees of that conference might be familiar with that fact that during one of the nights of the conference, we have a pizza dinner, a talent show, and a dance. What longtime attendees also, I have met those males with autism at that conference. They believe, in the name of self-determination, that they have the right to fight for inclusion at that event. And I have had to explain to them that because the rule says this event is only open to females, that regardless of how self-determined they are, 
because no male has the right to participate in that event, they do not have the right to fight to partake in that event. However, if a female with autism wanted to partake and just needed some social assistance, they could speak up for themselves because they would have the right to partake. But that's one thing, in my opinion, is often overlooked when we teach self-determination. We don't teach a lot of people with autism. You know, if you can't be in a, in, be a that also has to be remembered too, is that not only does self-determination entail you speaking up for yourself, it's the fact that since you're talking to other people, they have the right to speak up to you as well. You can focus solely on what you are doing to speak up for yourself, but often ignore the fact that if people are going to be self-determined, there are going to be times when people are going to speak up to yourself to you as well. How do you respond to that? How can we teach people with autism how to properly respond when they are the ones that are being spoken to? Time when we didn't do something that upset each other? It's because we were able to speak up for ourselves when we needed to. It's because we were comfortable enough to be able to sit down and talk to each other when we needed to and make a resolution. Even sometimes when those resolutions necessitated bringing up a sensitive subject or something that some people might find inappropriate. I have a friend, for example, who has autism with a very sensitive smell. Sense of smell. Their sense of smell is so sensitive that we had to confront the fact that no matter how hard I would try to bathe or shower before seeing them, I could still make them uncomfortable because of that sensitivity. We actually picked a perfume, a scent that didn't bother them, and we made an agreement that I would wear that perfume before we ever hung out. That has to be met. Yet, you are in an environment that is deemed it inappropriate to talk about that need. That's another question that needs to be answered. That's another thing we need to teach. I was once at an autism convention with a friend with autism who had a very personal need. I will not share that need out of respect for that person. The problem, though, was that that need had to be addressed. It got in the way of that person being able to function independently in that event. They needed assistance. The problem, though, is that that need could not be openly discussed freely. This individual could not just openly say, when your typical high school kid engages in adolescent rebellion or, has, or wants to create that identity, they almost always do so within the context of a group. Whether it's, you can call it a clique, you can call it a gang, you can call it a posse. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you know, one of the most confusing things I dealt with in high school was I saw all these kids engaging in rebellion against norms, and here I was, the person with autism, not understanding this type of rebellion while I resented a lot of social norms. What I realized was that groups give people power to challenge social norms when they need to 
through the power of the fact that a group creates a social situation where if people have mutuated. You know, it's funny. Tim talked about my foray into the National Hobo Convention. At the National Hobo Convention every year, there are sometimes groups who proclaim themselves anarchists. You know, I actually, just to prove a point, tried to join this one group of anarchists, and they kicked me out. <laughs> Seems crazy, but you know what? It turns out, as although these groups pretended to be lawless anarchists, they had a series of unwritten social rules that I violated. <laughs> and, and the amazing thing was, no matter how much they believe in anarchy, they still had the same rules anyone else had. If you don't follow the rules of our group, you're out. Now, I have to admit, trying to test their anarchy, there were some things that probably I shouldn't have done. But it was really, but I really had proved my point that even these, even a group of rules are just something, are just rules that I cannot work with. There are some that are. But the one defining factor is, is someone willing to sit me down and teach me those rules? Or is there an expectation that I'm going to have the ability to learn them? Now, there's a person in this audience that I want to introduce. And if you're in another place, you will not be able to see this person. This person's name is Eric. Uh... <laughs> and Eric and I work at several anime conventions together. And, I, and when I work at anime conventions, I host presentations about autism to teach attendees at anime conventions about autism. And I do so because a lot of people with autism go to anime conventions. But one of the things that brought me to the anime convention scene is the fact that anime conventions, in, in my experience, have an understanding of the fact that people need to have that assistance when understanding those social roles. And what I like about anime conventions is how when you register for an anime convention it was also helpful so you could promote Geek Con too. Oh, uh, okay. That's where you're going. So um, like James said, we both work numerous anime conventions. Uh, shameless plug for Geek Con here. <laughs> yeah. I didn't plan this. Um, with anime conventions, the other side is not just like the autism community itself is. A lot of anime fans are excluded too because they like that kitty cartoon stuff. When in all reality, depending on the show, believe me, it's not for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone that's seen Samurai 7 knows that one. But the other side of it, like he said, with all the quote social rules we have to follow, is they're usually on either page one or page two, first thing you see, and they're listed out in numerical order. And for anyone that needs assistance with anything, we have a place called Convention Operations, which is like the resource room in high schools where you can go and be like, okay, I need assistance with this or I need assistance with this. And the goal of that is to make sure everybody is included. Like I know there are some anime <coughs> conventions out there that have actually started hiring uh, sign language interpreters for people that need that assistance that are hard of hearing. Or a lot of conventions now have dedicated people for someone like James and I with autism to walk them through the hallways or to make sure that they're okay. That so many high school teachers are hoping their high school students will eventually learn and master. Heck, for example, when I was in high school, my resource room person was an anime fan. I ran into him at GeekCon two years after high school, just completely out of the blue. And we sat and talked for a little bit and did the whole, hey, how's life going for you, yada, yada, yada spiel. Because the other side of it for anime conventions was I found a place where I didn't feel out of the ordinary. And it helped me kind of a little bit more accept those, quote, social norms. And it gave me a place where I felt at home within my own community, basically. Thank you for sharing, and I'm glad. I hope that encounter was better than encountering Mr. Corrado at the club in the Sleepover film, if you remember that movie. <laughs> and I remember sleep that movie Sleepover. 
<laughs> You're going to give me nightmares here, dude. <laughs> it's actually a really nice movie that teaches awareness of a lot of the social issues that middle school kids face. So We do have the Is My Roommate Dead Stick, though, from No Baron Cod. A lot of adults with autism have been judged negatively for going to a playground and playing even though emotionally they still want to play on the playground. Anime conventions have given a safe place for these adults with autism, most of which who, they're not bad people, they're not really creepy people, they just are emotionally at a different age than they are chronologically, can express that interest and not be thought of as weird or creepy. Because anime conventions have done so much that a lot of teachers often aspire to, that's why I wanted to share and promote what conventions like Econ are doing. Anyone who wants to, to learn more about how anime conventions are helping people with autism, with self-determination, other skills, you can actually go on Geekon's website, geekon.12. And I'm not trying to promote this necessarily for people to go to the convention, but I'm trying to promote how this convention has helped people with autism self-determinate as a model that teachers can look at to understand personal space boundaries. That's why I'm promoting this. And the rule of cosplay is not consent is not just consent to quote touch them it's also can i take your picture can i give you a hug and heck you've seen these the people that walk around with big cardboard and sides that say free hugs now i do not know what your views are on this but i actually think that's a, i actually support that oh yeah definitely. because what what is really nice at anime conventions is people will put on signs that say free hugs so that the hug people who do hug and a lot of the people who have issues with personal space then know who they can freely hug and who to stay away from. Basically, it's an accommodation where if you're one of those people with autism who have a hard time knowing not to invade people's space, the free hug system is a system to make sure that those people know who they can hug and who they can't. In fact, a lot of the people who put those signs on are people who enjoy hugging who put that sign on so they can accommodate that deficit of theirs. Thank you for sharing, Eric. You're welcome. Can I go sit down? Yes, yes. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. And if, if not, if there's no questions, then um, I'll just read from the 25 easy rules of Comic Con etiquette. All which right. Which is friggin' hilarious. Definitely. <laughs> oh, they, they get whacked. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love this. I and swear. I'm glad you understand that this promotion was not entirely commercial, but actually to to make a point about self-determination. Yeah, they some of the social rules that are out there are fan, are fantastic. Yeah. I mean, some of them are, are, you know, I mean, like stay hydrated. Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. I love that one. Um, along with the number four, um, complaining about lines will not make them go faster. Why? Utu the Watcher will notice your griping and whisk you away to a 99.9% .9 identical parallel dimension where every line is five minutes longer. And you know, one yes. of the interesting things too is that like a lot that. of these rules, Comic Cons used to not always place them, and anime conventions actually were the leaders who told Comic Cons, hey, you'd better be putting your etiquette on your websites too. When I'm at an anime convention and I'm befriending some who's female, I always ask how old they are so I know whether or not they're over or under 18. And in fact, at many anime conventions, you are expected to, so you know exactly what the different boundaries are based on who you're talking to. In fact, the fact that I had to do something there that was absolutely prohibited in many other settings really taught me a lot about social context. Yeah. <laughs> So a lot of conventions, what Eric was saying was a lot of conventions now have different badges for the different age groups, so it's easier to differentiate because it can be confusing. I mean, I know I look 20, but I'm not. And so I know some people get confused by this. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like James's younger brother. Um, and so I would have to wear a badge to make sure that people would know um, how old I am. But just to follow up on what you're saying is I, I looked up some more, and, and so I'm thinking about school and how we teach you know, proper behavior in school. Well, how, how about this? Don't take pictures of cosplayers without asking. Well, don't take pictures of anyone without asking. Stop all this, you know, <laughs> you know stop it. There's actually this really nice, great social comment. Uh, free hug signs don't equal free grope signs. <laughs> like that one. 
Don't randomly hug, grab, or touch people. That's a universal rule. Don't be too pushy, unsure, ask first. Those are great rules for life. Yes. Not just anime conventions, not just for people on the spectrum, but for all of us to be able to get along in a social setting. Those are some of the key rules. And one of the reasons why I am so enthusiastic about this environment when I go to autism things is I'm trying to promote how these places teach people these rules for life. Yeah. How people with autism learn these rules for life and how teachers and educators can implement what they're doing to teach people and how they can implement this in their schools. Excellent. Are there any questions from the room? For James? Not for me, for James. I have one. And we'll repeat it for the, the group. James, you do so much traveling. You are probably the most self-reliant person, self-advocate that I know. What would you say are the three um, top things that you do? To... You learn very easily that while it looks like you're self-reliant, you aren't. In fact, everyone... Excuse me, I have to get the phone. Everyone, to some extent, is not self-reliant. Everybody depends on something to get by. It's not always a group of people. But the fact is, think about this. Everyone has to have money to pay for their necessities. The way most people get that money is through work. You're dependent on an employer paying you so you can have enough money for your necessities. If you lost your job, you wouldn't be able to be as self-reliant. Everyone depends on something, whether it's dependent on money from their work, whether it's a group of friends, that help them if they can't afford something. So the key to my ability to travel isn't self-reliance, it's the ability to, you have to respond to no exceptions. Some authority you have to respond to, but you can find ways to negotiate with that authority. Here are two different examples. I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, attending an event. Due to a computer error, money that I had purchased to put on my Milwaukee bus card did not go on the card. I got on a bus, swiped my card, the computer said it was empty and I had no cash with me. It didn't matter how much money I'd spent, the fact is, is that the bus driver was gonna get half to ask me to leave the bus, and I was gonna have to listen to the bus driver's authority to have me leave the bus, because as far as the bus driver was concerned, I didn't have money to pay for the bus. On my ticket, on my bus pass, why did it not appear? I couldn't just, didn't just have to passively say, oh, your money's gone. I could work with them to figure out what happened. The good news is I was able to and the situation was resolved. What I've had to learn is knowing how do you respond to different figures of authority. Oh, and I will tell you honestly, I've never been arrested but I've had many encounters with law enforcement on the road. There have been many situations where law enforcement has misunderstood a situation I was in or just had to make sure a situation I was in was legitimate. In every case, it was never because of illegal activity. But I had to learn how to interact with law enforcement so I could help them understand that the situation they were seeing was a legitimate situation. And what I have to admire are cops in my community who, uh, who when I had an encounter with them, my parents, and I actually went to 
our local community police and, they, and introduced me to. I would sometimes have situations where I would be out in the community hanging out with my other friends from high school and people would think that I was actually not in high school and older and would complain that an adult was hanging out with high school kids. When the law enforcement found out that I was in high school, and in fact, in one case, the, the kids I was, my friends were hanging out with, they were actually protecting me from some actual criminals in my high school who were trying to actually set me up to do stuff that was illegal. When the law enforcement realized that this group that people were misunderstanding was actually a support system that was protecting me from some really bad kids, one of which did end up going to jail, they vowed to protect me. And they have, and they did for the rest of my high school career. So that's another thing that I learned. It's knowing how do you properly engage different authority figures, because it's not just the same for everybody. And third, what are the stakes for you? are high for me. If I have to maintain good terms with this one person, I'm going to work my butt off to make sure I don't alienate myself from that person. Like if someone gives me a place to stay when I travel, I work my butt off to ensure that I am on my best behavior as much as I possibly can. Even though it doesn't always appear that way, internally I'm working my butt off. But Let's say I'm at a convention with a bunch of people who I only see a few times a year. They've never put me up. They've never helped me. We just see each other at conventions. Then there's not really as much stakes if I lose good terms with them. And one thing I've had to learn is who are the people I really need to be on good terms with? I have to thank, in fact, my high school experiences for teaching me that. One thing I actually learned is that if I wanted to join a group... Um, I was going to ask if you wanted to play us a, a short tune to, to take us out, since how you, you, you left it up here, um, and I am not playing it. Um, that would be one of the worst decisions that I could ever make in my life, would be to try to play the flute. So I've heard James play before, so... If you wouldn't mind indulging me, I yes. would appreciate a song. All right. So we'll be coming back online around 10.15. Thank you very much, Sites, for figuring out how to work with some of the technical glitches we have. We're going to try something on our end and try to, try to get it better uh, for you guys as well. Thank you so much for your patience. A um, couple things that struck me as James was talking um, that may be good discussion notes, which again, feel free to add your own, but what is it that we can change or adapt? in the way that we talk about self-advocacy um, to try to get to the social interaction that James was talking about, that it was, it's more than just like, I want this, but to figure out more of those social interactions about when is it appropriate um, and inappropriate. What needs to change um, in the way that we structure our, our teachings, our classes, our interactions, our social groups um, to try to help our students learn this? before they get out into the big wide world where they don't have that support that they hopefully have in high school. Um, so that's the main question on my mind. Um, please feel free. <laughs>
Okay. All right, and we have the picture. All right, so welcome back to the people here at Madison College, and I do want to publicly thank the awesome people here who brought in all sorts of different food. Um, so if you're planning on joining us again when we do this next year, uh, start to plan ahead. Uh, make your muffins now. Put them in the freezer. Oh, yeah, we'll plan. Rethaw them. I'm, I'm all over it. Whatever, <laughs> Whatever we bring, man, we are going to eat. So, yeah, it's March Madness. It's, yes, it is March. Year. Yes, it's – oh, my gosh. I have to fill out four brackets yet tonight. Yeah, I, I know. I have to today. fill out my brackets. Okay. I got another pool. Ah. I'd rather sit here and talk here, but you know, I know that we have Wisconsin and Minnesota hopefully still connected. We have switched um, some of our electronics in the background, so hopefully this will be a smoother broadcast here on out. Um, do want to acknowledge that the uh, Appleton Wisconsin Sibs and ASW have sent us a picture of their site. So thank you very much. You guys don't get to see it. Um, sorry, and Madison, uh, you just get to picture these wonderful, happy, smiley people. Um, in Appleton. So thank you, Appleton. Welcome. And um, site coordinators, you do have my email. If you wanted to send a picture, that's cool. We'll try to get it up in the next break. Um, maybe someone here will take a picture and we'll get it to Clark. I don't know. You don't have to, but feel free. We're building community as we speak. Um, speaking of which, um, I'm going to walk over here for a moment and then I'm going to be right back. There we go. Thank you for that, that moment. Yeah, as I said at the beginning, uh, please do not expect perfection. Um, if you do, you're in the wrong place. Um, so I am very, very excited, besides what's hard in the piece of paper, to introduce our next speaker. So Sarah's going to come up and talk to us. Uh, Sarah has a, a PhD from Michigan State University. Really? You're a Spartan? I am. And they may or may not be in my final. Okay. All right. Well, for the sake of the Big Ten, good luck, Sparty. Um, from Michigan State University in community psychology and is current the lead for the Honest Open Proud program at Rogers in Health. Uh, the Honest Open Proud is an evidence-based program designed to help people make strategic, safe decisions uh, related to disclosing their mental health challenges. She's also part of the Wisconsin Initiative, for, uh, Wisconsin Initiative for Stigma Elimination, WISE, which I think is a cool acronym, statewide coalition of organizations and individuals promoting inclusion and support for people affected by mental health challenges by advancing evidence-based practices for stigma reduction efforts. So some of you are probably asking, when did we switch over to our mental health world? Well, number one, we all know that just because somebody has autism or developmental disability does not make them immune to mental health challenges. It's, it still can leave them with depression, anxiety. It could still lead to some of the, it could still, they could still experience some of those challenges in mental health. Also, I very much believe that I don't have all the answers. I don't even believe that if we gathered everybody who's an expert on autism or developmental disabilities in a room together, that they would still have all the answers. I think we need to continue to look beyond our silos and beyond our walls to see what other people are doing. And so when we were thinking self-disclosure, I have been to a couple Honest Open Proud uh, breakouts before, and I was like, Yes, this is the message that I want for the students, the families, the kiddos, the adults that I work with, is I want them to feel a part of a community, and I want them to feel proud of who they are and not ashamed. And so when this opportunity came, I'm like, you know, screw it. I know there's plenty of people within the autism community and developmental disabilities I, I can reach out to. But this is a message that I really wanted us all to hear. Um, so with no further pressure, <laughs> but aren't Sarah, I, I'd like to welcome Sarah Reed.
Sarah. Did you leave something up here? Yeah, I did. I did this <laughs> last time. I'm going to take my glasses with me this time. I spent five minutes looking for them last time. Okay, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the fabulous introduction and for having me here today and for James who his presentation has given, I think, me some really great fodder to recycle and resurrect a little bit. In my presentation, I think they pair really well together, so I'm excited to be here. And at that, we'll be moving forward. So as Tim mentioned, I am here representing WISE, or the Wisconsin Initiative for Stigma Elimination. I imagine we might actually have some WISE members uh, in one of our satellite locations, so if so, I want to say hello or good morning to you. And we are a statewide coalition uh, bringing together organizations as well as people with lived experience to bring about evidence-based practices for stigma elimination related to mental health challenges. And the majority of people really do speak from that perspective of having lived experience either for themselves or as a family member of somebody who does have mental health challenges. And here are a variety of our WISE partners spread across the state, uh, probably not all represented up here, but a good number of them are, such as MHA, NAMI, DPI, uh, Youth Empowered Solutions, and a variety of other people. So I said that we are based on eliminating stigma and bringing about evidence-based practices designed to decrease stigma related to mental health challenges. But what do I really mean when I refer to stigma? Broadly, the, uh, that there are negative, hurtful, debilitating ideas that can become beliefs that then drive discriminatory actions geared towards people of oftentimes marginalized groups. And there are a variety of different types of stigma. They're listed up here. Internalized stigma, which I'm going to refer to again in a minute here, this sense that we come to believe some of those hurtful, debilitating things that we hear from others public stigma that we might experience in our interpersonal lives, in our day-to-day -day lives with those closest to us, with people with whom we interact. And then structural stigma or macro-systemic stigma, which comes from the policies, the practices, from organizations, from the legal system, from large systems that we interact with or that we may need something from. So I think that when I introduce stigma, it can sound, kind of sound as a really amorphous concept, or when we talk about discrimination, we might think of it as occurring in isolation, as in one isolated event. But oftentimes people experience stigma across a variety of facets of their lives. And as an example, I'm actually going to resurrect something that James shared with us earlier. He said that, people living with autism oftentimes experience a sense of being excluded, of feeling unwelcome, or of blatantly being told that they're not welcome. So if we put ourselves in the position of someone for whom that's true, then we can think about the variety of different circumstances in which they may experience that sense of exclusion. It could happen with your brothers and sisters of feeling like you're not able to play with us or you can't take part in some activity that we're doing could happen with your extended family in a sense that you're not welcome here unless you abide by these particular rules and social norms and um, abide by these particular behaviors. It could happen at school where perhaps you're told you're unwelcome by your peers or perhaps your teachers feel may treat you like they're not willing to um, accommodate something, some particular need. Variety of different forms of public stigma that one individual can face, not in an isolated event, but over time. And then in the broader, in the broader sense, what about other organizations with whom this one person interacts? Could feel excluded at particular conferences, unwelcome. Can feel excluded by the media. Maybe there aren't pictures of people who look like me, act like me, or there aren't depictions that uh, show the broad diversity of people with, with this experience, with this background, with this particular challenge. So it can feel excluded or be made to feel unwelcome across a variety of different circumstances. And so I think looking at stigma as more of that pervasive sense that can come from practically anywhere at any time can give you more of a sense as to how it can come then to affect people's self-concept as well. 
and internalize that sense of stigma too. So in terms of internalized shame or a sense of self-stigma, I think when you experience public stigma from so many different places, it can really come to affect your sense of well-being, how you feel about yourself, and you may internalize some of those hurtful beliefs then. You might, just, might start to feel um, unable, incapable, not good enough, something to that effect. And if that becomes your sense of self, then why bother? Why try? Why care, in a sense? And so any program, in my belief, that tries to address stigma really needs to get at both facets, both public stigma and the idea that we can internalize some of these beliefs ourselves. This, this up here is meant to represent that stigma um, differs for each individual person. So the stigma that I experience as a white middle class woman with social anxiety disorder is not necessarily akin to someone who looks, acts, comes from a very different background than me, and also lives with social anxiety disorder. It's intersectional. The sense of stigma that I face is not necessarily akin to that of someone else. However, one of the programs that we have at WISE and that uh, Tim introduced to you and that I'm going to share with you today, the Honest, Open, Proud program, is really meant as a framework for making disclosure-based choices regarding any facet of one's identity that can be construed as stigmatizing or marginalized in some way, which is why I think sharing it with different communities is really fabulous because it has such a broad-based applicability to different people. I want to share with you a couple things that we know about stigma change, and these are the protest education and contact strategies are the three main ways in which researchers have tried to address stigma within the mental health community, but also in different communities. Protest is essentially what it sounds like advocacy coming out in arms against something that is stigmatizing. I think a really fabulous example James shared with us today is the students who are protesting uh, gun violence in, in schools. And so protest strategies are one way in which to try to reduce stigmatizing beliefs and actions. Can be really effective, but the caveat to that is that when one side comes out in arms advocating for something else, the other side does as well. So there's always that possibility. In terms of education, stigma change efforts, this is exactly what it sounds, trying to change the myths and misconceptions that are out there and that exist about a particular community a pit or a particular group of people. Well, what we find in research is that education strategies oftentimes show uh, short-term change in people's beliefs, but then sometimes um, opinions and beliefs revert, revert back to their original stigmatizing belief or stereotypical belief when you're encountered with something that counters what you learned in the educational intervention. Contact then is what has been shown to be most effective in terms of decreasing stigma. I see some heads not, nodding, so that's good. I think you're familiar with it to some extent. Contact, just having day-to-day -day interactions with people who have lived experience, who can share with you not only their struggles, not only their challenges, but also their resilience, their strength, their successes, and so on and so forth. It's really, really powerful in order to be able to do that. But unfortunately, the very reality of li living in a stigmatizing world makes that really difficult, really hard for a lot of people. And so the vast majority of people are not staunch advocates, are not out sharing their story loudly and proudly, but are instead making day-to-day -day decisions in their lives about who to tell what to and how to do so, and whether or not to. So the Honest, Open, Proud program, in my mind, really fills an important niche. If not everybody is out being an advocate, what do we do about the rest of the people who, again, are struggling with making those decisions in their, with their family, with their teachers, in the workplace, on social media, 
in the various different settings in which they interact or in which they have a particular need. So I'm going to share with you today kind of the overarching crux of the program because I think that it's a really fabulous way in which to either make these decisions yourself or to help somebody else, to guide somebody else in making these decisions as well. Now the program is designed as a small group program. About four to eight people, I think, is ideal in terms of doing it as a program. But what we've heard is that a variety of people, a lot of people, actually the majority, use it more as a framework in one-on-one -on -one conversations with their students, with their clients, with their patients, with their children, or in their own personal lives. And so when I share it with you, I don't want you to think of it just as a program, but instead to think, how can I use this in guiding someone else's decision around disclosure, or perhaps in framing my own? So it's based on an evidence-based program designed by Dr. Pat Corrigan at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And it is shown to decrease levels of stigma stress, increase self-efficacy surrounding disclosure, so to increase the sense of confidence you have if you decide to share part of your story, and a heightened sense of personal empowerment and lower levels of depression, particular in, particularly in girls. So I shared that it has broad-based applicability to a lot of different communities, a lot of different groups of people. And these are just some of the Honest, Open, Proud program adaptations that have either been developed already or that are in development as we speak. So we have a generic version designed for youth who are experiencing mental health challenges. However, there are some that are a bit more tailored. There's one that's specific to community of people living with Tourette's and associated tick disorders because that disclosure different that that disclosure choice can be different in some aspects if you have potentially um, a more visible type of um, of a challenge it's being adapted currently by actually a group of people in Oregon for sexual and gender minorities the disclosure process um, very similar and very akin to that community it's being adapted uh, by a group in Chicago for people who have made uh, attempts on their life. And we are doing research currently on, a, on, a, on a, a version that is for parents and caretakers of young people who are living with mental health challenges. And what's been really fascinating to me in leading these groups is to see how parents are applying the framework then with their kids. So they are not only finding value in the framework for themselves, but they're taking it and teaching it to their children or want to teach to their children, which is really cool. And they are naturally applying it to other facets of their identity as well. So in the last group that I led, there were four women in my group and one said, this can give me a framework for how to talk about the fact I had a miscarriage. Another one said, this gives me a framework for how I talk about my husband's substance use issues. And another one said, this gives me a framework for how to talk about being a foster care parent of a child of a different race. So I think then just in terms of its translatability, it's pretty self-evident how it can be useful in a variety of different circumstances. So I mentioned my belief earlier that I think any pro, actually, let me back up here. So James shared with us some really amazing guidelines used at anime conferences for helping to um, share social norms with people and in a way that's really upfront and in your face. We do the same in our program. The very first lesson has a kind of guidelines discussion and yet it is lackluster compared to what James shared with us. And so I think I actually want to steal that or tailor it a bit to the program. We suggest upfront that confidentiality, respect, and all opinions count are kind of our core guidelines that we abide by. And then we engage in conversation with participants to kind of co-create what those mean. Kind of lay, lay, lay the groundwork for our, our lessons together. Now as a program, this is designed to be done in either five or seven sessions. 
But again, because it's so adaptable and we want it to be useful in a variety of circumstances, we suggest that you use it in a way that works for your organization or for the population you work with. So we have some organizations that have done it in an entire day, some who have split it up into two lessons, and others who kind of just pick and choose which strategies or which tools they think are most relevant on that particular day. So as I go through this, I'm going to talk broadly about um, the strategies that are implicit in the Honest Open Proud program, but I want you to take and apply it to your own circumstances and think about either how could this be useful for kids I work with, if you're a teacher, a social worker, or something, um, someone who works with kids closely, or if you have a child who has a mental health challenge or a disability of some kind, how might this be helpful in helping them make decisions about disclosure? Or how you can apply it to yourself. So I mentioned that I think that any program based around stigma has to really address both self-stigma as well as public stigma. And we really start out thinking about the story we tell ourselves because that then becomes a part of the story that we tell others. And so we start off kind of emotionally laden with thinking about what are some of those beliefs that we've internalized? What are some of those hurtful beliefs that we have? And addressing them and learning a strategy for how we can reframe them. And so we start with the recognition that everybody has hurtful beliefs about him or herself. That's just reality. You don't have to have a mental health challenge in order to have hurtful beliefs about yourself. You don't have to have um, experienced stigma across every facet of your life to have hurtful beliefs about yourself. But hurtful beliefs we, t we teach are those that are limiting, those that are hurtful about yourself, and those that you've gotten from somewhere. So if you have been exposed to a variety of different people or places suggesting you're not welcome, then you might come to think, wow, I'm really not welcome, and here's why. I'm not welcome because there's something wrong with me. Something to that effect. And we do that by getting people to think about the different facets of our, their identity and who they are, what makes them who they are. I've written up here on this self-talk puzzle here a variety of different um, facets of one person's identity or potentially and then listing what are some of the core beliefs that I have related to that part of who I am. So one person might think of themselves as a student and have both helpful and hurtful beliefs about their role as a student. I'm really great at math and I suck in English and here's why. Or might have a bunch of helpful beliefs about who they are as a student with a lot of hurtful self-beliefs about who they are as a friend. And when doing these self-talk puzzles, we really emphasize that one of the roles or identities that we have people list their helpful and hurtful beliefs about is whatever it is that we've come together to talk about. So if it's mental health challenges, here's some of my beliefs about being a person who lives with a mental health challenge. If it's parents of people with mental health challenges, Here's some of my beliefs about being a parent of someone with a mental health challenge. And I'm actually going to stop here. I'm going to ask you all to play along and actually list one of your own hurtful self-beliefs because I'm going to teach you a strategy that I think is really powerful for how to reframe them. And it will work a lot better if you're doing it yourselves. And I promise I will not put anyone on the spot. You need not share them. This is completely private. And I can't see everybody on the, on the video feed by any means, but I'll ask you to do the same. So maybe I'll just give you a minute to try to think of one related to any facet of who you are.
Yeah. Went too far. Oops. Okay, there we go. All right, and we're not leaving on a downer for the first lesson by any means. Instead, we teach a strategy for how you can counter or reframe these negative beliefs. And if you're a facilitator of this program, I really like the idea of doing it as a puzzle like we did here. So if we have, here are some negative ways in which we feel or think about ourselves, then when we create a counter, symbolically, I think it can be pretty cool then to see a, a helpful belief on the other side. But for the, for the sake of doing this here with you all today, we'll just walk through it as is. So our five steps to reframing net hurtful beliefs about yourself. The first is just to notice and name the hurtful belief, which if you took uh, my recommendation to identify one, you've already done. So you would have already done step one down here on the bottom. So as an example, because this is a rather abstract process, so I'll walk through it myself and share with you one of my own hurtful self-beliefs as a person who has struggled with mental health challenges over the course of my life. When I was younger, I really thought there must be something wrong with me because I need medication in order to regulate myself. That could be a belief amongst people with mental health challenges, people with various disabilities as well, and it's, it's quite a common one. So my step one, I must be broken because I need medication. I must be sick because I need medication. Number two, just going from step one to step two, I think is really, really powerful because we're taking ourselves away from thinking about our beliefs in regards to ourselves and placing them onto other people. And most of us are much harsher on ourselves, quite frankly, than we are on other people. We have much less self-compassion than we do compassion for other people. So if I want to universalize my belief, I might say something akin to, people who need medication are broken. <laughs> and for me, that already kind of divorces it from its power. It sounds quite silly. Now granted, I've done a lot of work in terms of my recovery, it wasn't automatic that I might think, wow, that's a really silly belief if I place it on other people. But it loses some of its hold over me just going from that step one to step two, if I'm honest. Although for a lot of people, their internalized sense, their internalized beliefs, internalized stigma, internalized sense of shame is so deeply rooted that that's not going to be an automatic, oh good, I feel better about myself, I can move on with my life and on to my next hurtful self-belief. Take it a little bit further. Steps three and step four are to do some reconnaissance, to do some uh, digging, to uh, research a bit, whether or not other people have those beliefs, whether or not other people mm -hmm. whose opinions we value would promote those beliefs. So in my case, I might identify my parents or my therapist or my partner as people who I trust and whose opinion I value and who I could go to to see whether or not that belief holds water, has any weight to it. And hopefully I've chosen well. <laughs> hopefully I did not choose people who would validate my opinion. And so I might ask my therapist, do you think people who take medication are broken or flawed in some way? And Hopefully, she'd say, no, lots of people take medication. My mom uh, was in the medical field and might say, do you believe that about people with physical ailments? If not, then why would you believe that about people with mental health issues? Mm -hmm. My partner or a friend might say, wow, I take medication too. Does that mean that I'm broken as well? So essentially, I'm doing some digging to see whether or not my belief is something that other people would buy into. And if I've done that, and hopefully I've found that it does not hold any weight, then I can create a counter. I can create a more helpful belief. And for me, that needs to be something that's believable because otherwise you're never gonna internalize it into your self-concept. I think a lot of people have really good BS detectors, right? And so if you go, if you go from, um, 
um, there's something wrong with me because I take medication to I am fabulous, it's not going to be something that is internalized for me in any case. And so it has to be something that's a bit more believable. Medication helps me function. Fact-based, something simple, something I can remember, something I can pull out of my back pocket whenever that hurtful belief starts to crop up. So this is one example, I think, of where the tools and the strategies in the Honest, Open, Proud program can have really broad-based applicability because you can have a hurtful belief then again about any facet of who you are. And if you can, if you can identify a hurtful self-belief, you can walk through this process. And how do we determine whether or not we want to share a part of who we are with other people. That's a big choice. That is a weighted choice. That is a difficult choice. And that is, by and large, the objective of lesson two. And actually, to go through this, I'm going to pick on the audience here a bit to help me actually weigh this decision in a hypothetical example. So if I am a person who has a developmental disability of some kind, or if you're a parent of somebody who has a developmental difficulty of some kind, what, is, what are some of the things you consider when deciding whether or not you want to talk to other people about that reality? Actually, write some of the answers up here. So we talk about it in terms of pros and cons. There are benefits to talking about your experience, and there are drawbacks or cons to talking about your experience. So, just very broadly, what are some of the potential benefits of sharing your story? Thank you. If it's a very um, noticeable disability, um, you'll get the information right or they'll make it up. So that's a pro, as far as I'm concerned. If it's a very noticeable disability, it's better to share than have people make up Something. So you have a little power over your own story. Right. James, did I see your hand? If something can't be hidden and you try not to disclose, people are going to try to explain behaviors no matter what. Mm -hmm. And you might find yourself in a situation where people are going to attribute to your behaviors to something that's completely different and possibly negative without knowing the real story. Sure. Oh, that's the wrong word. Not really control. So if, for those of you on the feed, James had said that if you have a very visible uh, challenge, uh, other people are going to make attributions about your behavior regardless. So a benefit of sharing then is that you can have some ownership or control over that story and what gets shared. Um, can you summarize that in one or two words? I don't have much room to work with. Just basically just visibility. Visibility. Mm. Thank you. Other benefits. What about if you don't have a, a something that's visible? It can allow for connection with others. Connect with others, absolutely. Thank you. Did I see your hand? Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you mentioned the fact that it's hard to see, like, what's going on. Like, I know if I was blind, I, I wouldn't know where, like, the room is, and I wouldn't know who's talking to me. So, it just takes people like that a little bit longer to connect with the world, and they do really well. But this, for me, would be a little bit longer and be a big adjustment. Okay, so it can help you make adjustments. Yeah. Or you can get uh, accommodations. Accommodations, yes. Yeah. That's a great word. Thank you. Like understanding vocabulary, it's kind of a struggle I've had ever since middle and high school, understanding what new words mean. Just reinforcing it by seeing the accommodations office or just meeting a speech teacher and that to really help. Sure, yeah. so accommodations or other needs can potentially be met. Does that work? Yep. Yeah. Anything else come to mind? It eliminates surprises. Hmm. Because if uh, 
you have a disability that's not visible, but eventually it will reveal itself, it can be very surprising and, and upsetting to people when it is revealed in a surprising way. If you warn them ahead of time, it eliminates that surprise. Eliminates the sense of surprise. And you can prepare other people in a sense. Anything else? Educates others. Educates others. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? Any other way in which sharing might impact other people? Provide support. You can provide support for others potentially. Yeah, certainly a motivation for uh, people who are advocates. Well, it reduces if the person has concern or anxiety because they're encountering a person that, that they, they don't know what, they've never seen a person like that or they don't know what the behavior that they're seeing is, by telling them, then they don't have to be concerned or worried about this person. Yeah. Okay potentially decrease anxiety either because of how somebody responds or you just get it off your chest. You get it out in the open. And so decrease anxiety. The other one I hear oftentimes is just the sense of being authentic and genuine with other people. That there's a real power in um, shared vulnerability. So that's one side of the spectrum, right? But then there are a variety of drawbacks, too, or potential cons. So I'm not going to write these on the board because, one, my writing is horrible, and, two, I'm kind of running out of room here. And, three, going forward, I kind of want to emphasize the pros is becoming reasons for disclosure. But what comes to mind is some of the cons of talking with others. Of just talking with others? Of talking with others about your challenges, your struggles. Well, one thing is they might ask like a personal question and then you don't know how to answer it and then you answer it wrong. That's happened to me before where I've answered it wrong. And I get kind of nervous and I just have to say something. Yeah, it can be yeah. anxiety producing regardless Whatever of whether happens. you answer wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, just letting you know, yep. we got 10. 10 what? Minutes. Ten minutes, okay. That's because I'm getting so many fabulous yes. answers and I'm long winded. So, <laughs> stigma. Stigma is a big one potentially. Or if you're a young person, bullying or responses that you might get from others that can be heart wrenching and crushing or emphasize those uh, negative beliefs you already carry about yourself. So there are pros and cons. And part of the program is getting people to weigh pros and cons for themselves in a variety of different circumstances and settings. So I asked you to create a list of pros and cons really broadly, and you did a fabulous job, so thank you for playing along. But then we start to break it down and to be a bit more contextual, to think about what are the pros and cons of talking to your family? What are the pros and cons of talking in school or at work? For young people, especially, what are the pros and cons of sharing your story on social media? And some of those pros and cons will be really, really unique. And then we also emphasize that you have a variety of different options in any social setting. It's not black or white. It's not yes or no. It's not yes, I'm going to share everything and anything. You have some uh, power o over your story and can set boundaries around it. So the five different options that we share with people are uh, listed up here in kind of this cartoonish way here. Social avoidance, so you just decide you don't go. Perhaps you have social anxiety, so you're just going to stay home and not bother. And that carries with it pros and cons of choosing social avoidance. Perhaps secrecy. I go, but I don't tell anybody anything under any circumstance. Again, has pros and cons. Selective disclosure is what most people decide upon, and that is the sense I'm going to be really strategic about who I share what to, and really thoughtful about what I share with them. Open disclosure, then, is I'm going to tell anybody who asks me the truth. So maybe somebody asks me why I carry this little squishy thing around. Mm -hmm. It would then be incumbent upon me, if I choose open disclosure, to tell them 
It's part of how I deal with my social anxiety. And then broadcasting is this idea of advocacy. I'm going to share um, loudly and proudly in order to try to help other people. And all of them, in any situation, then carry with them their own unique pros and cons, which is a super important part of this framework because I don't know about you, right now in my life, I make pro and con lists for everything and anything, and I itemize them, and I quantify things, but when I was a young kid in the midst of some of my worst difficult challenges, it didn't cross my mind to do so, quite frankly. I'm going to try to zip through this in 10 minutes. So, if you've decided that you want to selectively <coughs> disclose, which I think is what the majority of people do, quite frankly, how can you do so in a way that's safe? How can you do so in a way that hopefully helps you to reach your reason or goal for talking with someone? <coughs> First, you can try to match who you're talking to to your reason. If you know that you need accommodations at school, that kind of limits your list then to people in a school setting, potentially teachers or pupil service staff. But then you can also think about what are the various characteristics of people that suggest they would be helpful and supportive and a safe person to talk to. And that will help you, again, meet your reason. So that's things like they're trustworthy. Maybe I already have a relationship with them of some kind. They've shown sensitivity to others. Maybe they've shared part of their story and could relate. Uh, it's trying to identify, again, some of those traits, characteristics, behaviors that suggest they will be helpful to you. And then, even if you've done that, uh, you need not jump all in and tell everyone everything. Instead, you can try to get a little bit more information to assure yourself uh, that they will be helpful. And so we suggest doing something called testing the person for disclosure. And I love this strategy because people do this naturally. Sexual and gender minority youth often do this before coming out. Uh, people in my age cohort are starting to get married and have children, and so whenever somebody does so, we might take the opportunity to ask our partners, what do you think about so-and-so getting married? <laughs> to try to get a little bit more information as to how somebody will respond to our own disclosure or our own needs. So testing someone, just taking advantage of something that occurs naturally, be it in the media, be it in politics, be it in your personal life, to dig a little deeper into how somebody may respond. And then we go through an activity that helps people respond uh, to negative responses because that's a possibility. You might do all this legwork to determine who's a good, safe person. You've tested them out. You know your reason. And then, lo and behold, somebody responds pretty schmuckily. It happens. It does, and it might be completely um, unintentional, a knee-jerk reaction, something to that effect. Um, but if it happens with somebody you're disclosing to, it hurts. <laughs> so how can we respond in a way, potentially, to salvage that relationship, to still get our needs met, hopefully, um, and, and to move on? Because I don't know about you, but if somebody responds to me pretty schmuckily, I'm going to back down. I'm going to become quiet and reserved and avoidant, or I'm going to be downright angry and mad. <laughs> but that won't help the situation any. So we practice a strategy for how to continue that relationship, that conversation, and hopefully have it go well. And that is to do two things. One, just to keep reiterating what your reason is. If you need accommodations, just maintain that point. I'm coming to you because I need X, Y, or Z. As I said, I just need help. Something to that effect. And then, if you've already done all this legwork to determine they should be a good, safe person, call them out on their good nature. I, I expected better because I've observed you helping other people. So that's one tip that we share. But we also develop a more uh, streamlined and individualized coping plan, coping strategies for how to manage and prepare for these, what can be really difficult conversations. Lesson four is where people are given the opportunity, if they so choose, to share their story. And we really emphasize that it's an opportunity to do so rather than an expectation. 
if because we've taught you a process for weighing your pros and cons and so if you've decided it's a good opportunity to do so then you're given a chance and you're given some chan a chance to get feedback uh, positive feedback from other people about your story and we put some really um, streamlined strict boundaries and guidelines around sharing around the length of how, how long you get to share around um, that there will be no criticism of people sharing and that everybody else in the group will respond uh, with compliments or affirmation thereafter. But allow you to do so in whatever means feels comfortable and safe to you and to express yourself, be it in the, in the, in the way of um, a rap song, a poem, a story, reading something, or however you see fit, basically. Lots of different ways to share your story lots of different ways um, to do so in the program. But the one thing that we do emphasize, regardless of how you choose to share, is that it emphasizes not only the challenges and struggles that you have faced, but also the resilience, the strength, the wisdom that you bring as a result. And so we ask that about 50% of the, the storytelling be about that aspect of your story as well. Lastly, lesson five is about peer support and helping to identify mm -hmm. what those resources are either in your school, your community, or online that will help you access both peer and adult forms of support. And we provide for you one means in which to indicate that others in your environment wish to be a safe, supportive person. So we try to make this process a little bit easier for people. They don't have to do all the legwork themselves by creating what we call our safe person decals. And this, uh, as it says up here, I seek to listen and support. So if you display the decal, then you are a person who wants to be a safe, supportive, helpful person for others that they can disclose to, that they can feel safe disclosing to. And we've purposely made the decals really broad so that it's applicable to people sharing with you any aspect of who they are, anything they're struggling with, any particular challenge. We've given out over 30,000 of these, and I think it'd be really fabulous if every high school in the state were to display them, actually. The second part of the decal are promises that you abide by or that you seek to abide by if you display the decals. They are, you can learn more actually at our, yeah. sorry I'm feeling rushed, sorry to go over. Well, that, that's only because you're being rushed. <laughs> I yeah, to, yeah. I, I want to affirm your feeling. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> sure. So the decals, like I said, um, we want to share with you. I did not bring them today purposely because I want you to order them because we can track you then. And so <laughs> if you if you go to safeperson.org, you can order decals. We will ship you one or a bulk of them if you have a large event. You can also see a training guide on how you can teach other people to um, abide by the seven promises or to put them into practice. And there are little video skits as well from high school students who actually show what the seven promises look like, which I think is pretty fabulous. So I will be actually going back to Milwaukee after talking here today, it's an hour or so trip. And if I get a bunch of emails from people saying I want decals, I would be so stoked. <laughs> Otherwise, I know it's kind of hard doing this kind of video format, so I just want to share my uh, website or my email address with you up here in case you are interested in the Honest Open Proud program in a more thorough type of training and how it can be applicable for your particular community. We can set that up, be happy to work with you in order to do so. We provide these trainings all over the state and in partnership with a lot of really fabulous organizations and partners. And then uh, you can also email wise Wisconsin, wise at wisewisconsin.org if you want to learn more about this particular mm -hmm. program or um, order decals that way as well. So before you get off the hot seat, Sarah, a couple sure. of questions. Sure. Um, which Sarah also very graciously um, gave some questions for possible discussion. So we'll leave those up. We'll, we'll cut the mic, but we'll leave, I think we'll be able to leave the questions up. We'll, we'll see about that. 
But I know that a lot of what you were talking about has to do with, um, you just mentioned that there are trainings on having people learn how to go through the Honest Open Proud to lead other people through Honest Open Proud. So if somebody's out there going, wow, I really think this would be cool for my um, autism adult group or my teen group or just for my autism community, my developmental disabilities community, how could they arrange for how, how long is the training? Yeah. Um, how many grants do we have to write for to afford <laughs> it? Um, you know, how if, if we're really interested in, in having people trained and then taking this to the next step of this is what it looks like for autism and developmental disabilities. Absolutely. Well, I might actually put Ellie Jarvie on the spot because she is a hop trainer and she's been trained in the version for Tourette's and associated tic syndromes. But um, for that training and for others, it tends to be about a full day training, but we can work to accommodate your schedules and break it up into a two day training mm -hmm. as well. We will come to you. We ask that you help recruit a group of people to make it cost effective for us to come um, wherever you may be. We want um, you know 12 to 20 people who tends to work really well with, can be from a variety of different backgrounds and uh, we try to be work with you to make it accessible mm -hmm. in terms of cost. Yeah because one of the things is I've been talking to uh, one of Sarah's colleagues for uh, probably about six months to a year now about what would it look like um, for autism and developmental disabilities. Um, and one of the things that always comes up is how do I get that critical mass? Yeah. So I'm working on trying to gather that critical mass of people together that want to learn how this can work in the autism and developmental disabilities community. So one of the things we did really well when we adapted our curriculum for the Tourette syndrome community is we partnered but I think sure. for the Tourette's version it meant um, emphasizing more the fact that you may have a visible uh, challenge that you, you you face and so I think it, it doesn't take much in order to make it applicable for other other groups in fact I think um, in one of the focus groups some of the students said hey we would we would do this in a general honest open and proud you know we wouldn't need a Tourette specific so it's nice they have the option yeah yeah Absolutely. Um, as we say goodbye to Sarah, I want to bring James back up because there was a question that I'd love him to address that somebody somebody sent me, which please don't try to send me all sorts of questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, okay? But I, I did really like this question. Um, but I will be, you all are now part of the Community Practice on Autism Spectrum Disorder and Developmental Disabilities List Serv. So it's a WISC list. I send out things every so often about um, upcoming events. Um, one of the things that we will do is we will be working uh, with with Rogers Memorial and well actually with Wise Wisconsin um, to see what we could do about having a couple trainings so that we can you know really start to to think about what does self disclosure mean beyond just how do I tell my future employer that I might have a disability because it means so much more than that it means embracing who we are and choosing who gets to know what part of me. Um, and I think that's really important um, to teach each other. Um, whether we have disabilities or not, it's important to teach each other. I don't, you know, I, well, enough said. Enough said, you said it much better. Thank you so much, Sarah. We will have these questions. I think we're gonna be able to leave them on. But before we take a break, we did um, to, for discussion, not just a break, that comes after your discussion. Um, we had a question for James um, that I thought was really good. Because, I, you know, I know, I see this happening all the time. Um, how do you handle it when others speak out for you? Mm -hmm. So James, if you would like to. Well, I see personally that thing as positive and negative at the same time. Sometimes it's a good thing for people 
to speak out for you. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Let me get one example I can give when it's a good thing. A lot of teachers and parents are often concerned about what's going to happen when people with autism age out of the educational system. I went through that. Every adult goes through that. But I actually made a decision in terms of self-determination. I realized that even after I've graduated, there was no rule saying I couldn't continue to attend athletic events at my old high school. So I decided to continue attending those events. And eventually, the high school actually formally legitimized my ability to continue doing so. I was welcome to join my old high school's booster club, which turned out to also contain other adults who were former students who continued to support as well. Now, in that club, if people get a little, people challenge or question, why am I still there? The booster club speaks out for me. That's a good thing. A bad thing, however, is when someone speaks out for you who doesn't necessarily know your situation and otherwise might actually make it worse. So an example I can give for that was when, <clears throat> was when I was in a situation where I did not disclose a, disclose a need to take my medication. And I had a reaction from not having that medication at an event. It was, it, was, it was very visible. I passed out. People tried to speak up for me, saying, now, we don't know what it is, but we know it's probably not because he was a bad person or because he was, not ba he was basically neglecting his health. Although they tried their best to speak up for me, so a lot of people got very worried and it made it worse when in reality they should have just come to me and said, okay, what happened? When I eventually disclosed the medical side effect, that was resolved, everything was resolved, but I had to disclose it. No one could disclose that what really happened was somebody didn't give me the opportunity to take my medication when they should have, and someone didn't give me the means to store it when I needed it, and then I got sick. So Thanks. thank you. Um, and if they, Sarah, if, if people want more information, I assume wisewisconsin.org would Absolutely. be a good place to go. Yes, or to my, my email. Or email her. So we'll leave these questions up. Um, please take some time for discussion. We will come back online with uh, sound and everything, audio and visual, at 11.30. So feel free to split it up with about seven and a half minutes of discussion, seven and a half minutes of break. However you want to do it at your site, you know your site better than I do. We'll see you at 1130.
All right, as, as soon as I can get control over the Madison College crowd, uh, we will come back online. This unruly group that I have, it's all the sugar that we have provided them uh, this morning. Um, so it is great to be back. We had a really good discussion here. I'm hoping that your sites are taking advantage of that discussion time and talk about the different connections, the different ideas about what can be done locally. Um, Sarah has reported to me that uh, you didn't exactly crash her email server, uh, but she is very, very excited with the request for the um, I listen uh, decals, uh, which there is one outside my door, A123 of Waysman. If you need someone to talk to, come on by. Um, of course, I'm usually at places like this, but you know, feel free, come on by, check out my office. Um, we want to transition now to Matthew and Mitchell. Matthew. Matthew? Matthew, right here. Matthew. Mitchell. Okay, come over here, Matthew. Oh, okay. Okay, so Matthew and Mitchell, who I've met before, and you would think that I would figure this out, but I haven't. But Matthew and Mitchell are 21-year-olds and are currently attending Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, studying digital marketing, web design, promotion, and event management. So I need to get you guys on board to spread the word about the community practice. Don't, yeah, okay, I'll use, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll utilize you later. All right, um, all good. Diagnosed with autistic disorder at age three, both have received intensive and post-intensive in-home therapy, along with numerous additional interventions at home and school. They graduated from high school in 2015. You guys are getting old. Yeah, well, yeah. That, was a, that was a long oh, yeah. time ago. Really? That's, that was a long time ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. 21, I can't believe it. That's crazy. Yeah. Nearly three years. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Oh, well. Crazy. While there, they earned several varsity honors as managers, statisticians, and videographers for football and basketball. Both participate in varsity golf for four years, um, a game that infuriates me. And Mitchell earned the most approved golfer award for two years in a row. Nice. Matthew also played on the junior varsity and varsity basketball teams during his freshman and junior years. They participate in the Future Business Leaders of America organization, earning back-to-back -back trips to the state competition during their junior and senior years. Yes! <laughs> they have been highly involved in decisions related to their education, including completing student-led IEPs, working with staff from the Accommodation Center at North, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, and learning other forms of self-advocacy throughout high school and college that has resulted in success. They have a speaking consulting business called Speaking About Autism, LLC, and have presented several times to parents, educators, students in Wisconsin and Michigan related to their experiences living and learning with autism. Both are interested in making a difference in the lives of others who present similar challenges along with others who support them. We have had them here in the past and we are just so excited uh, to welcome back Matthew and Mitchell. Thank you guys. So good morning, happy hump day, everyone. <laughs> yep, and we, we made a two and a two and a half hour drive to Madtown to be with you guys today. And it's really special to get this opportunity to be here. And it's our first speaking engagement in the new year of 2018 as well. So booyah. Bring on the new year. <laughs> okay, are you on my name? Here? And my name is Mitchell Labarge and I'm a student at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. Okay, uh, my name is Matthew Labarge, currently a third year student at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. And uh, like he mentioned, I graduated from Bondo High School in May of 2015. And today I had the opportunity to speak at my favorite city in Wisconsin, and kind of the United States right now, Madison. I love this city and I've been here for many different events and love it. So thank you for bringing us in Madison College today. So we're getting started. This is our junior year in high school. Yes, time really flies, as we mentioned. Focus on transition from high school and then on the post-secondary lines, whether you go to college or workforce or, or the service and military. We just really want to self work on self-advocacy for other students. Goal is to teach us self-advocacy and determination, being dedicated to what, what you do, no matter if it takes till midnight or one in the morning. Or we, or, or we miss Monday Night Football to get the most important essay done. <laughs> we became involved in the IEP development during, the, during this process. And personally, we invested and developed our time to, to our future through running our own IEP, showing our problems, and self-advocating the teachers on what we needed to get done to be, be where we're at today. 
Um, we want to talk briefly about the student led IEP process. We actually um, were the people that kind of tested it for the Bondwell School District. We were kind of a part of the test to see, okay, how is this going to go? And it started at our senior year or junior year? Junior. Okay, you have a way better memory than me, obviously. <laughs> it started our junior year, and we did it for actually two years now, I remember right. Um, special education teacher therapists began working with us, and we thought of this, and we implemented it into a PowerPoint slide. We're both going to show you our PowerPoint slides in the next few slides, so you'll actually see what it looks like. You'll see the template. Uh, they developed the PowerPoints from start to finish, from slide one to the end, and showed us a process of how to plan a meeting. And to be honest, I'm going to briefly talk, and now I'm able to plan my own meeting someday if I need to because this IEP process helped me plan this meeting. So on my own, I can plan my own meeting for whatever I want to. Uh, and then the most important discussion of what my disability is, and autism is my disability, the developmental disorder, as you all know, um, and it's, it's a significant disorder that does affect me every day, but I learn to continue to overcome it every day in my lifetime. And then we also had to ask parents for their input in IEP. Um, what kind of home life do they have? Uh, is there structure at home? And then how are they doing at school? And how do we compare how are they doing at home and then school? And how do we bring it together as one? That's kind of what that was all about. And then we discussed uh, present level and then the goals and services to help reach our goals at school. You know, we actually became involved in FBLA. We kind of signed up on our own, nobody told us to be an FBLA, and yet we went to state twice. And the teacher, Mrs. Coles, that we had first for the uh, uh, advisor, she was really awesome. She accommodated for us and, and told us, hey, this is a good event. And then this kind of started our speaking business, the e-business event, and we did a fake business, made a fake book. Now we're currently working on a real book, actually. And we'll get into that later, but we're working on a real book. Um, and then teachers practiced the final PowerPoint again. We kept repeating the process. So I'd say as teachers or administrators, continue to um, go through it so then the students understand it because that's what we did to succeed. IEP presentations, your steps to success, educators, making sure technology is set up properly. This is an example. This is a wonderful classroom with great technology, a great computer. And, and a smart board just to set up and stream it, stream everything and, and especially having your own flash drive. And I first learned the sky drive, uh, saving and everything to sky drive, but those days are now over. <laughs> and the student, er, and students like, like us were the presenters. Have a staff member complete the legal IEP separate during the meeting. Offer incentives to students. We, we have a coffee shop still currently at Bondwell High School called The Bears Den. The, there was one really good special education teacher that started to run it, and it's a, it's a full coffee shop with popcorn, healthy snacks, and coffee there for students to, students to take a bite to eat during their break time and watch a little TV on the process too. It's like a lounge area. So they offered free, they offered free cards so we could buy our own by our own item after working on our IEP the week after the first week of school starts, just hammering it down and keep working hard to make a successful meeting. And then actually this is what I was talking about, we we're going to go through the IEP slides, right? So here we are, we're going through, this is my junior year, um, I'm introducing, again this is my words, welcome to my IEP meeting, it's not a teacher's word, um, teachers are awesome and everything and for all the people at Bondo thought of this idea, well, including my mom, was <laughs> really awesome. I thank everyone, including her, for giving us that opportunity to self-direct our IEPs, make it ourselves, and do it. It was actually independently, too. I mean, we literally did the PowerPoint slides. I remember with my teachers, I did the slides, and they asked me, what do you want to put on here? What are your goals for after college and after high school? and we put on like everything we could think of. It was my, you'll see on my presentation, it was my thoughts and they're all my words. It wasn't anybody else's words out of mine and that, that's why I think it's so cool about self-directed IEPs. Um, so let's keep going. These are the things that the teachers noticed about me. 
Uh, I participate while in class. I always have a smile on my face. Whenever I'm in the hallway, I don't even know I smile. Because people smile at me, I'm like, I don't even know I'm smiling at the time. Because I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> Hard worker. I, I'm more willing to help anyone with any issue. If they come up to me and talk to me, I will talk to any human being in the world pretty much. That's probably a good thing. I don't know. Um, and then I also have a huge, huge passion for sports. Love sports. March Madness is on tomorrow. And I was a basketball coach over the winter, so I can talk about sports all day. But we're focused on IEPs, so I'm trying to keep my <laughs> priority straight. Uh, focus to um, there are things to improve on. Ask more questions in class. Like, I got to make sure in college, sometimes I don't ask questions. I'm shy. Well, I don't know something, I got to make sure I ask it. And that's something that I'm still working on currently. This is how you can help me. A comment. Oops. Excuse me. This is yours. Oh. Oh, you can talk. Go ahead. Accommodations. That's how you Got can it. help me. This is very similar to my IEP. So tests and quizzes. For me, reading tests and quizzes is really helpful. You can really learn and visualize what you studied when you really studied a hundred times before the test came. Then you felt smarter and you got the answer correct. Taking tests in a quiet area. It's really distracting when other people are walking or putting on their headphones and even even just things as setting their cell phone down when we're trying to take the most important exam. Taking notes from other people that that have all main points. I don't need we're on time crunch and it's something good to say, but I'll move on. Being able to type my notes, it's really helpful to type over writing. Even I do writing like, oh, I need to write this, I need to write this, this is on the test. But you really just got. You really should type, and our our future and right now is heavily reliant on technology. It's sometimes keeping people alive, and schools really need to need to really build up the technology like like Bondwell did. Breaks taking breaks is very important. Even just just simply taking a walk in the hallway or getting a drink of water, it helps your you helps your brain flow. It flows the flows the energy and how to get back to what you need to do. Modify assignments such as having having computer or word banks. Extra time on quizzes, I kind of re re related at first to that. Using a calculator, it's, you're nev never perfect with your math skills. So it's really, really helpful to use a calculator and add equations that you may not know at first. Type my answers rather than writing, as, I, as we mentioned earlier. Use technology, then then draw assignments because not everybody is an artist. I'm definitely not. It's using technology is very important, and that too it takes you less time to get the most important project done. Then, and giving extra workspace as we re relate related earlier. Excuse me. Okay, these are my current educational goals. I will keep working on my self advocacy skills asking for help when I need it, and then also taking tests and quizzes in a quiet room. Um, and actually, what happened with that was I actually had to tell my teacher, I was in algebra class with a teacher, and I felt as if I couldn't take a test with 15 students because it was distracting. Kids would be done, they would go, they would go get a drink of water while kids are working. Even tomorrow I got a final exam at NWTC, and I had to schedule accommodation services I do it all on my own or else I'd be totally distracted with people walking in and out. I'm ADD too, just to let you know. I barely <laughs> keep my computer from dying, but it's all good. Um, I'd like to improve my math skills to the ninth grade level. I will work on a transition, fan, or transition plan to help me be successful in college. I will work on my attention and process speed using the Activate program. And the Activate program was a really nice program that one of my special ed teachers introduced. Now that he's done, here is my chance to talk about my IEP. I'm Mitchell LaBarge, former student at Bondewell High. You rah rah Bondewell High. <laughs> there are the positive ways that you can help me. Don't have too many activities at one time. It's really hard to focus when it happens. When someone's talking about even the time of the day, it's 2.50 and, the, and school gets out in less than 30 minutes. It's even that's distracting to get, get out of there and talk about something else and take a break. So that one, I can't keep up with notes, as mentioned. Provide information, print in notes, and then relate to five, because running low on time. Allow me to use technology for projects. 
this is all the stuff actually that we explained earlier. Let's move on. Here's, so, oh. here's, here's a list of educational goals. Self-advocacy, all the things we talked about earlier, it's really divided up well. I like the way this PowerPoint looked. Transition, go, going on college tours. I went on a college tour first at UW Oshkosh. Looked at it at first, but not for me. And then I went on one at my junior year at NWTC. Uh-oh, what happened? I think you might have accidentally hit the top button. Or the battery died. I mean, it could be a number of things. I'll look at it. You keep talking. So when I went on college tours at NWTC my junior year, I really started to like it. Uh, it was just a nice campus, and people were very welcoming and really, really, excuse me, I don't know the word, but they're, they're just really welcoming and there for you no matter what. Met it, the student involvement people, accommodations, they were really there. And I, it, got, it got to, I got to my post-secondary education goal my senior year once I passed the tape test. I was accepted into college. Yeah, I will say that about NWTC. Um, we were our junior year. And honestly, I was super nervous about going to any tech school slash university or even looking into it was just like, a, I don't even know how to describe it, like a two mile radius or way more than two miles. Just, it was really just hard. I'm like, oh my God, I have to leave high school, leave all my friends. And it was honestly very scary to leave everything I had at Bondwell and all my friends are all at Stout and you know they're all gone so I had to figure out something for myself but NWTC said hey this is a these are services we provide and and these are our programs we have and then of course when I was first applying there I couldn't decide what I wanted to go for so I have two different well degrees so far I have a certificate and a technical diploma or no I have a technical diploma I'm getting a certificate after the spring so but that's thanks to NWTC for getting me my technical diploma and certificate in a span of two semesters. And I'd say I got to thank the whole entire staff at NWTC. Without them, we wouldn't be where we are. And that's a big credit to them. What were the IEP meetings like? They meant at first, I was very nervous to say it, just nervous about school overall, the environment. Thanks for getting that fixed. And they meant nothing because I didn't know the experience of deciding to get help or what my struggles were. I was that nervous to explain to anybody what the skill what the skills learned that I needed to learn. Your What were the IEP meetings like before the student led IEP process? IEP meetings honestly made me feel anxious and made me feel kind of I don't know if I want to say this, but kind of worthless in a way that I didn't think I would ever graduate high school or anything. It kind of made me just feel like worthless, like, well, what am I going to do then? And when I got to kind of decide how to put the IEP in the perspective, I, nothing was bad about the that IEP with the teachers because it seemed like there were some positive things too. But the student led IEP is just for, even just the word student to me gets me excited. If I went back to high school right now, I'd absolutely do a student led IEP because it, it was such a nice process for us. and. I highly encourage student led IEP meetings for anyone that's here, that's in a school or wherever. Um, it it was a really cool thing for us. As much time and work as it takes, I understand that, but it, it's it's worth it. It really is worth it. And people have talked about me in front of me. I still call constructive criticism these days, but that's when it really, really bothered me. I didn't know how to handle it. I sometimes thought of just negative everything. I just went really south when that happened. So the IEP process helped eliminate that and just had just said, hey, this is what you can improve on. We all make mistakes, like like the teacher said, as well as parents and family. It's very helpful that they help too. And that in those kind of life situations it's help. How the process is doing led IEP it it helped. It helped when I learned self-advocacy skills, such as asking for help. Teachers really saw that. They said in their parent-teacher conferences how well we're doing with it, how great of students we are, and we learned important strategies, which we ended up using for college after a few months of nervousness. 
we use the same thing, same thing, same theory in college. I ask help when I need a question or what something means. Still, still don't know sometimes what vocabulary means. Even, even the vocabulary of racism. Sometimes I think of think of it differently than what the term says in my diversity class right now. Learning that is good for the future, and I'm starting to get used to it as time goes on. I need accommodations. Sometimes need to retake a quiz one more time just to really process the information better and feel better about myself after working harder when I put in more time with it. All right, I will just briefly say mine. I learned to uh, go back. Oh, my bad. I mean to yell at you, but I just, I learned to develop self-advocacy skills. Nope. Other one, such as asking for help in high school, which made me learn important strategies for college. So learning in high school how to develop the self-advocacy skills was super important. More is I had more self-confidence, which I could explain to the teachers what my struggles were, and it did make my school year more successful, and I started to enjoy it in ways when I kept succeeding in life and in school itself. Our college years. College years, well, I talked, I know about NWTC, but um, here was our timeline for college years. Um, we also had struggles. I mean, we had struggles. We've done presentations from age three when we first got diagnosed to autism all the way to college. But today we're just kind of sticking to soon that IEPs, but we've had many presentations on the whole whole stage of it. Um, today we're focusing just on these. Freshman year, the importance of self-advocacy skills. We continue to build skills every day. Every day we continue to work hard. Uh, we, we continue to commit to whatever we want to do. And as adults, we can decide where we want to go. Uh, people have been very supportive of me lately. I mean, I sometimes I'm all over the place, but hey, I'm an adult. I gotta go do what I gotta do. I gotta go to work. I gotta go to school. I uh, do my commitments that I want to commit to and do the things that I do commit to in, in a full effort. Initiating help with a college freshman. First, one of my main things was getting help for an accommodation services staff. That was one of the main things that really helped me be successful at NWTC. Also, when I had anxiety, I would get coaching from parents as well to talk to instructors because I wouldn't talk to an instructor. And um, it... One time I was emailing somebody about a math assignment that was wrong and I was so nervous to talk to the person, but the person helped me out a lot and I appreciated her feedback and understanding that I didn't understand the math and I really struggle with math, so I kind of, math, not my word, but math, uh, so I really struggle with that subject and really don't like seeing a math problem. It gives me blurs and I can't stand it, but she was at least there to talk to me about it and to help me and coach me. Uh, small steps. I I then emailed the instructor. The first step was I emailed them and then if they didn't answer the email, I'll go talk to them. Uh, overcoming anxiety, the more help we got with anything, it could be home life, it could be school, anything, the easier it got. Uh, we got help with many things in our lives and the more I asked for help, the easier it got for me. And some teachers, they're not easy to talk to and it's okay, you gotta keep trying. Utilizing resources, counseling services, they're always there for you when you need help. They're free licensed counselors whenever you need them and they'll assist you at NWTC. Accommodation services, we've related to that about three, four times now, so that might be a little old of a subject in student involvement activities. The career planning with advisors, really just talking to them, making sure your future is relative for what you really want to do and have your parents come at least once to make sure they're on the same page with what you want to do. And uh, self-directed education, here's where we're at right now. Um, I finished the technical poem like I talked about earlier. In December, I'm finishing my certification in promotions and event management, actually by May of 2018, so I'm hoping to use what I learned in that certification use it with this business and other areas in my life so I'm actually gonna take that very seriously this summer and do some work for my business and then the associate degree with marketing plan to get that in May 2019 and then I also recently got my first ever job which was a power team internship a couple years ago I researched a local arena football team probably 
uh, a mile and a half from my house, went to their office, said who I was, and said what I was doing, or said where I was going to school and explained my situation. And I just wondered if they offered any jobs, and they said, yeah, we offer internships. So I reached out to this Green Bay Blizzard organization, their uh, arena football team located in Green Bay at the Rest Center. I've been there for many events, so I got to work at the Rest Center for my first time this month, and it was really just a unifying experience. And I really thank the Green Bay Blizzard for asking me to be an intern because it actually counts as one of my college credits. So it worked out really well both ways. So. And for me, I, I got my technical diploma in May of 2017, digital marketing. Hard work really pays off. And then I decided to continue my education with a marketing associate degree and with a digital marketing emphasis, just promoting this, promoting on how we can get hooked up for more of these wonderful opportunities. That's an example. And I also want to promote your event management, just that first, running social media, running our business, which is a big, big deal. And I'm excited to announce that I'm going, going to Scotland to study abroad this May, May 19th to June 2nd to find hopefully some more marketing strategies just see another side of the world I never would have thought in my life I would say that especially at 21 years old so I'm very excited to go soon all right and then here's our final comments today uh, becoming self-advocates it took uh, years of hard work with parents therapists teachers and staff without all the support family teacher staff uh, more people Without all the support, we would not be where we are today. So we give them a hand and a shout out, and we thank them for all they do for us, and how and thank you for all they continue to do for us. Oh, go back. Whoops, technical difficulties. Oh, that's all right. It may take a lot of time, maybe challenging, but that's true. Hard work and effort does pay off. Oh, again, here's our contact information. We want to share this before we hang it up for the day. So recently, we actually, we kind of upgraded our business card. So we have our speaking about autism email on here. If you want to take a picture of this, this is our main speaking about autism business card and our website, speakingaboutautism.com is on here. Speakingaboutautism at gmail.com is our main email. If you want to hook, get hooked up for speeches in the future, or if you just want to ask us questions or anything, we can answer. Well, anything, it, it can be for anything, folks. It, it can be for speeches. It can be for just, hi, how are you doing? It doesn't matter. Um, that's just an email if you want to contact us about anything. And our main phone number is 920-471-2208. That's our main business number. Also, quickly, I want to share, we have a business brochure as well. And I feel really powered to actually share this brochure because... It's really cool, and it tells about our story living through autism, and then it shows a picture and with our mom, and then it shows us speaking, so you can kind of see the environment we've been speaking in. This is where we spoke back at, at Rock Garden in Green Bay. We were at Rock Garden in Green Bay this day, and this was actually one of our life story presentations where we went through. And this slide was a Packers versus Eagles game, so we were talking about sports in our presentation. So we actually have a lot of fun when we speak. And then our presentation topics are as well are on here. Testimonials and anything you need to know. So we have brochures up there if you want to take one. And I think that's all we have. guys very much. Uh, we might have time at the end for questions, so I hope that you'll hang around and eat some more food. Oh, yeah. Um, hand out the brochures at the end. Yep. Um, thank you guys very much. Better bring oh, up God. Emma. So half the time I remember what I'm doing, half the time I don't. So Emma attended UW-Madison, where she completed an undergraduate degree in special education. She's currently a cross-categorical special education teacher at Middleton High School in Middleton, Wisconsin. Emma's also a unified champion schools liaison for Middleton High School. In this role, she helps them work with Special Olympics of Wisconsin to provide inclusive athletic and social opportunities to students. 
in addition to working at uh, Middleton High School because she has boundless energy and just nothing to do in her free time. Um, Emma has no social life, just so you know. Uh, she's in graduate school. Okay, that may be a lie. I'm sorry. Emma. <laughs> Emma's in graduate school studying education through UW La Crosse. One area of focus in her studies is student-led IEP meetings and the impacts these meetings have on students. Emma is incorporating what she has researched about student-led IEP meetings into her practice at Middleton High School. The students on her caseload have been taking an active role in planning and leading their IEP meetings this year. So Emma, we are very interested to, to learn what you have been learning. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Do you want your glasses? Oh, oh my sorry. gosh, thank you, Emma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so hi everyone. Again, uh, my name is Emma Becker and I'm super excited to be uh, speaking with you today. I've had a lot of um, fun getting to listen to the speakers who've come before me and I think you know what I have come to say will wrap up a lot of different things that have been discussed today, um, which I think is pretty cool. So I will just get started. So, you know, as James mentioned earlier, um, self-determination is this set of, you know, beliefs and ideas and skills that people can use in order to uh, make, you know, practical goals for themselves and do what they need to do to achieve those goals. And so in my research, you know, I found that uh, implementing ways for people to uh, practice their self-determination skills is super important. Um, and so while I think reading research is really interesting, um, which maybe makes me boring, I don't know. Uh, well, I think it's really, you know, interesting and motivating. What's even more like meaningful is getting to hear the experiences of like James and Matthew um, and Mitchell, because it, those are people who are actually, you know, living their lives as self-determined people. So that's pretty cool. So a lot of what I talk about might sound super similar to what we just heard, um, which I guess just tell me, tells me that uh, great minds think alike. My process for going through um, implementing student-led IEP meetings uh, is super similar to what Mitchell and Matthew talked about. So um, hopefully, you know, hearing from me or from a teacher's perspective might give some new information. So. Um, when I go about implementing student-led IEP meetings, I start with collecting some baseline data. So that means I just um, try to tap into what my students already know so that I can figure out what they uh, may need support in going forward in the process. Um, the second thing I do is actually take time to prepare students to lead their IEP meetings. And then uh, it's time for the actual IEP meeting. And then after the fact, I'll, I usually collect some more data to see, you know, like what growth there was for students in the process and to see, you know, what I can do better next time in supporting students through their student-led IEP meeting. So I'm going to take you through each step a little more in depth now. So uh, for my first step, I gather some baseline data. And so I just have some images of uh, up here of a pre-survey that I give to students. And it might be hard to see, but I'll go through it a little bit. So there's two different parts. The first being uh, the student just survey. It has a few open-ended questions about uh, stu asking students, you know, to identify which uh, disability that they're served under, to talk about what they know about um, the purpose of an IEP, and to see if they can, you know, describe what accommodations and modifications are. Uh, and then the second part of my pre-survey that I have students, you know, respond to uh, is uh, these Likert scale statements. Uh, and all of these statements are pertaining to you know characteristics of uh, a self-determined person so like one of the statements on the Likert scale that students uh, respond to an example would be uh, I think it is important to tell my future employer or my future college or university about my disability my IEP and my accommodations and modifications and so students are supposed to respond and tell me whether they 
uh, agree with that statement, if they're not really sure, or if they disagree. And so all of this information is super helpful for me as I, you know, help to get students ready to lead their IEP meeting because I get some more information about where their mindset is um, before we even get started. So I consider this a really uh, important first step in the process. So once students have, you know, filled out this uh, survey for me, uh, we do a few different things to prepare to lead their IEP meeting. So the first is that we review the survey. So um, we'll go through, you know, what the student wrote together. And so in that time, I will clarify anything that was confusing for students. So like if a student didn't know what, you know, IEP st uh, stood for or what accommodations and modifications are, that's the time where I try to, you know, clarify that special education jargon. Um, and then after we've sort of, or after I've done some explicit teaching about uh, what an IEP is and what a student's accommodations and modifications are, uh, we work on creating a presentation. And it's really almost exactly the same thing as what Matthew Mitchell went through. So uh, I have a template of a PowerPoint presentation that students are able to um, insert their information into and depending just like on the student some students do this mostly independently um, whereas other students require a lot more support I just kind of you know accommodate and modify on the fly um, when it comes to this process so once the students have you know gotten all of their uh, information together into a presentation we take time to practice so they will um, go through the presentation with, uh, with me and I'll be able to, you know, see if there are any um, parts of the presentation that we might need to like talk further about so that they feel, uh, feel like they're ready to lead the IEP meeting. Oh, and another thing I uh, forgot to mention is I also have like a template for a script that students, you know, could use if they wanted an extra tool or resource while they're um, leading their IEP meeting in addition to the PowerPoint. Um, I haven't had any students use it, um, but I did have one student make his own script, which I thought was really awesome because it just showed me that he was taking... Uh, you know, an extra step to take ownership over his IEP meeting and over his education, which was, which was good to see. So, I, so now I'm gonna go into like what the IEP meetings would look like. And so I start every meeting um, pretty much the same way. And so what I do is I have this poster hanging up in the room of where we have our meeting and I will have everyone at the meeting go around and introduce themselves and share a strength of the student that we're meeting for and I'll just record what everybody says on the poster. And so this is an example from my most recent IEP meeting um, and I do this for a few different reasons. Um, first I just you know want to get the meeting off to a positive start and I think it's important to keep meetings student-centered and um, strength driven which I think this is you know an activity that helps to do that um, and then I think it's also powerful to have like you know a visual representation uh, to refer back to that you know talks about what a student's strengths are even you know as we go through the meeting we might talk about things that you know may need improvement or areas to work on and it's always good to keep these things in mind as you go through the meeting so after we go through and fill out this strengths poster is um, the thing you know we've all been waiting for and that's the the student-led IEP meeting and so um, students will lead this part um, independently uh, for the most part, like for the most part, most students lead this part independently. You know, there are some students who might not be at the, the place where they're ready to lead it um, fully individually um, or independently. And so then I might, you know, step in and help to guide students. But for the most part, in my experience, students have been able to do this, especially with all of the preparation work. And so students discuss everything that we would discuss if I had been leading the IEP meeting. So, you know, 
they're going to talk about their strengths and things that they find challenging, um, you know, their dreams for the future. So whether that be um, where they want to go to school or what kind of career that they want to have, um, where they want to live in the future. And then they will talk about their annual IEP goals and then they'll have to, you know, explain their accommodations and modifications that they need in order to help reach their goals. Um, and so when I first, you know, started this process, it's a little, it was a little um, intimidating or kind of difficult to, you know, lose control of the meeting and to hand it over to somebody else. But, you know, that's really important because the meetings are all about the students. So it only makes sense to me really that they're the ones um, taking the lead in the meeting. And so I had one student, you know, go through this whole process and he's a really bright kid. He has goals to be like uh, an aircraft designer and he um, is generally a super quiet person. Um, he doesn't usually talk louder than a whisper at school, um, but at his IEP meeting, it was like, a complete 180 which was really fun to see and be a part of you know he was speaking at the appropriate volume and he seemed really proud to be going over all of the information in his presentation um, and you know he almost didn't want to stop talking about things and so that was um, a pretty you know um, great experience for for that student So once, you know, students have gone through the process of preparing for their IEP meeting and then leading it, I um, have students do some more like self-reflection so that I can see, you know, what they thought of the experience and to figure out, you know, what they took away from it and what they thought was meaningful from, from the experience. So I asked them some open-ended questions afterwards um, just about like what they liked about leading their IEP meeting, what could go better for next time. Um, and then same with the pre-survey, I have some you know statements that students tell me whether they agree with or disagree with the statements. And so like an example of one of those statements would be, um, I think leading my IEP meeting helped me become more confident in my disability and my skills. Um, Another one would be, I think leading my IEP meeting was a valuable experience and I think it helped me to improve my self-advocacy skills. So this also, the post-survey, gives me some really good information to help me go forward in supporting students the best way that I can. And so I just put together some data from three different students that um, have done student-led IEP meetings this school year. So the uh, blue columns represent the number of questions that students got correct on the pre-survey. So these would be questions about like, what does an IEP, or what does IEP stand for? What are accommodations and modifications? Those more like objective questions. And then the red columns represent the number of questions students got uh, correct in the post survey when they answered those questions again. So two of the three students, you know, improved on what they knew about their IEP and their uh, disability and accommodations and modifications after going through the student-led IEP process, which I see as a, a good um, indicator that, you know, it was a valuable learning experience because, um, that they, they took away something, even though they were, you know, small improvements or um, smaller, you know, uh, units of growth, it still, I think, is a positive, especially since a lot of these students, it was their first student-led IEP meeting. Um, and then just, I think, something else to say about uh, what I found interesting in student responses was that um, a lot of what students didn't know, um, according to their responses before, planning and leading their IEP was what disability that they were served for. So that seems, it seems like to me that that would be, you know, maybe a basic piece of information that they um, would know off the bat, but that wasn't even the case. So it kind of like, you know, kept me in check and reminded me that I just can't assume that students know things or that they don't. Um, so again, you know, being really intentional and systematic with collecting data has been super, uh, super beneficial for me as a practitioner. So then up here, I just have some different quotes from both students and a parent 
just giving feedback on the student-led IEP process. So the first two quotes are from students and the last one is from a parent. Um, these, uh, these pieces of feedback were generally mostly positive. Um, the first student said he somewhat enjoyed leading his IEP meeting because he was able to talk about you know, his future plans and needs. And then the other student mentioned that he liked leading his IEP meeting because it helped him to be involved in the planning of it. So what I got from that was that, you know, he felt like his voice was being heard. And then the um, feedback from one of the parents was that, you know, they just thought it was a great accomplishment of their student to take control and lead the IEP meeting. So my reflections as a teacher um, on student-led IEP meetings is that they're best practice. Um, and so even, you know, if students can't completely independently lead an IEP meeting, getting student voice and engagement as much as possible is, is really important. Um, and sort of like Matthew Mitchell said in their presentation, um, this takes a lot of time and effort. You know, it's a lot easier for me to just come in prepared with the information that I need to go through, um, and maybe that it's more efficient that way even, but it's like this is such a great opportunity for students to be building some really important skills that will come in handy for them um, after high school. So it's just a matter of prioritizing time and prioritizing this as something to focus on. And then just like I really saw students taking um, control of their education and ownership over their IEP meetings, um, which is really what it's all about. So with the last, you know, like 15 minutes after this session for when you have time to discuss, you know, here and at the satellite uh, locations, I just put some different things to maybe think about or discuss. One being, if you're an educator or if you work within a school, K-12 school capacity, uh, how can you incorporate student-led IEP meetings or just at least aspects of student-led IEP meetings at your schools? And then just more generally, um, what are some strategies that you have used to support people with disabilities in practicing self-determination and self-advocacy, you know, in school, at home, in the community, and not even just high school age students, but also uh, younger students as well. And so that's all I have. I appreciate you listening, and thank you. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, of course. Don't go too far. <laughs> so um, a couple questions. You just mentioned sort of there at the end. Um, I know you work with high school students. Mm -hmm. Do you have any adaptations or changes for like how to, I know we're supposed to incorporate that student voice at a certain age mm -hmm. and that they're supposed to be leading their education, their IP means. But do you have ideas, have you looked at, you know, that, that younger age and, and getting them involved in IEPs even, you know, out earlier than high school? Yeah, so I've seen, you know, resources for at least like student-led conferences, which I mean, it's similar to an IEP meeting. Um, and I've seen teachers, you know, have like scaffolded like multiple choice questions or fill in the blank kind of statements. Like in math, I learned how to fill in the blank and you know they might give some different options of what to answer with um, and so I think that's you know a really simplified way of just getting the student to verbalize and think about things that they've you know learned in school and what they can do with that information great and if um if people feel like you know they're really energized and they want to do it and they're like I just I don't have time to make my own surveys um, if we post this with some contact information, would you may, maybe be able to share what you've done now that I put you on the spot in front of 200 people? <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. Oh, good, I'm, good. Thank I, you so much for that. I'm happy yeah. to share and help or answer any questions that anyone has. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Someone on the live stream asked if your forms might be available. Um, I can make them available. Again, they're yep. just things that I've created. They're not, um, you know, there are like actual, um, like, research-based questionnaires for self-determination, like the ARC self-determination mm -hmm. questionnaire is one that, you know, researchers have um, compiled and, but of course I'm happy to, you know, like offer what mm -hmm. I do and what I know, so. So, yep, we'll get that posted on to our uh, website then. We'll continue yeah. to work with you. Um, I mean, personally, um, you know, I think the last uh, 40 minutes or so um, should be required watching for any special education students that are helping with us teachers 
that are helping with IEPs in high school. Um, I think this is the time and the support network that is there to help our students to learn self-advocacy, to learn who am I, what do I want, what do I like, because we all carry that forward throughout our entire lives. And it's best to do it in a safer environment right. than just being thrown out there. So I appreciate mm -hmm. all the work you've done. Thank continue you. the research mm -hmm. so you. that we can sit there and say, yes, this is definitely, you know, we continue to say this yeah. is evidence-based, this is the best practice, mm -hmm. this works. And I love the fact that we got the personal stories of how it works from the uh, educator side of how it works. Mm -hmm. This works. So let's do it. It's simple, you can do this. Thank you very much, yeah, Emma. thank you. <laughs> All right, we are going to turn it back to the sites now for the last time. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. Special thanks to the Leadership Education and Neural Developmental, Ability, dis, uh, Developmental Disabilities Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Waysman Center, along with Madison College, um, along with Waysman Center for the tech support all of the awesome site people make sure you clap for your site people who put together these things because there's no way i could set up 17 different viewing sites so without them this would not have happened so thank you so much and without you coming and joining us it also wouldn't happen so continue to learn together continue to learn how to make change locally continue to support each other have a fantastic day thanks Uh, questions for Matthew Mitchell, Emma.